obviously. So from hardcore engineering, our next talk by Puneet is more about people, processes, and scaling engineering teams. Over to you, Puneet. Okay, thanks. Hello, everybody. I am Puneet. Uh, today, I'll talk about a topic close to my heart. From startup to enterprise, how to scale engineering teams. Before that, a bit about me. Uh, I am Puneet. I graduated from the Pilani campus of BITS in 2013. Uh, been in the industry for about 10 years now. That probably justifies my gray hair, right? Uh, six years of these 10 years, uh, I was working with the startup. Uh, we built a lot of products. Uh, like when I joined them, we were an e-commerce company, a billion dollar valuation. But things didn't work, so we pivoted to private label furniture. Then we built social media applications. Then we built crypto backed token economies. So these three products, we, I was part of a team which built from scratch, zero to one kind of journey. Great experience, great fun, great learning. But then I realized that I wanted to move on and, and work for a company which was already operating at a scale. Coupa, I joined in 2020. Coupa is the leader in the business pen management industry. Uh, I joined them in 2020. Over the last three plus years with them, I've transitioned from a technical uh, IC contributor role to engineering manager role. This image reminds me of my childhood when I and my sister uh, used to play that seesaw kind of game. Uh, I used to love it when I was at the top, but in the industry as a manager now, right, a part of our job is to balance, right, to strike a balance. Uh, we're trying to strike a balance against what, right? It's speed of delivery versus uh, the processes we have in place, right? Startups, some of them may choose to lean towards more of speed of delivery. Enterprise companies, on the other hand, may lean towards processes, right? Uh, Coupa uh, operates at a scale. Uh, when I joined Coupa, I was honestly overwhelmed. There were a lot of processes. Uh, I'm a curious guy, like, like I, I used to ask people around that, hey, uh, why do we need all of those, right? Uh, over the last three years, I, I spoke to myself, people around me, uh, I understood the reasons, and today I'll talk about why they exist, and more importantly, uh, how they help us. Before we start with the content, right? Any Bollywood fans here? No? I am one, by the way. Uh, this is from one of my favorite movies uh, of Bollywood. Uh, I, I want you guys to spend a minute and think of what is the difference between this one and this one, right? Uh, Men are more happy, they are enjoying more. Uh, the beautiful lady Katrina Kaif is not here, maybe because of that, I don't know. Uh, but the difference I'm trying to highlight here is of seat belts. Right? Uh, as we all know, right, seat belts, they save lives, right? Uh, and and for, for enterprise software companies, for any company, right, these processes are like seat belts, right? When things are all fine, you don't even realize, but when things go bad, right? One fine day, they'll, they'll save your life. This picture shows a car, uh, a faster car, probably a racing car. It has more sophisticated seat belts. Uh, the faster the car is, the safer it has to be. The higher the stakes are, because the, the driver's life here is at stake, right? Because he's driving faster. Higher the stakes are, more important the safety is, and safer the seat belts have to be. Now, go back, right? I said Coupa is the industry leader, right? We have thousands of our customers. They use us for business critical transactions, right? Their jobs will stop uh, if, if we don't operate uh, there, right? So very, very important for a company like ours to, to, to stay safe in that sense. Today, I'll cover these five areas. These probably are all topics uh, in separate, but today I'll try to give a, a gist of what we have in these areas, how we build them, how they help us. Um, the first one, design reviews, right? Uh, design review is a simple process which helps us deliver complex slash, like whatever kind of stuff in a safer manner, right? Uh, even when I was at a startup, we used to have design, this kind of design reviews. It was just like it was informal. Uh, a small ticket I was working on to make a decision on how to do it, I'll just 
I grabbed somebody from my team over a cup of coffee or when they used to go for a smoke, I was just hanging around and then talked to them and then a decision was made. Uh, in kind of larger kind of epics, larger stories, uh, we pulled everybody in a meeting room, hey, we need you, we need you, we need you, come into a meeting room. Uh, 8 p.m., 9 p.m. we used to start and then fast midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., we had a decision, right? No document, it was all whiteboarding. Nobody left the room till we had a design, approved. Uh, and next day, we started development. Now, imagine, right, can this work in a larger company, right? It, it clearly cannot, right? Because the product is so vast, like no one person can know it all, right? And probably because of that, you have functional teams, right? At least Coop has a dozens of functional teams. They are cross regions, right? In US, in India, in Europe, and all of that. Uh, as part of the process, we want our devs, our PMs, our QEs, we want to force them to think on all these areas. Functional impact, performance impact, security areas, like who can see what kind of stuff, like SRE, because something like a Ruby upgrade, you make a Ruby change in your version, it works fine locally, but it will not on production, right? Because in production, you need the versions of Ruby to be upgraded, the AMI needs to go on the machine, right? So any change that you do needs to be thought through in all of these areas. Right? Uh, and, and we have a process for all of that. We want people to think, we want people to socialize, right? Because something which you believe is straight, simple, may not be because you don't know the impact it could have in other areas, right? Because you're not knowing the entire application. Pretty interesting, code reviews, right? Uh, so before I go to code reviews, right? Like any engineering managers here? Managers, no? One, two, three, very less, it's more of devs. Uh, so, so ask managers, right? They know that cost of fixing a bug is exponentially higher when it comes from a customer, right? Because if a bug goes to production, the customer sees it, they'll talk to support team, support team will spend some time, they'll talk to the manager, and then they'll talk to the dev, and then it, it, it's much more time consuming, right? So it's a lot more efficient if we have no bugs, right? Design reviews, code reviews, they help us to prevent all those bugs. Now again, in my startup, yes, we had code reviews, uh, but they were informal, like the first picture, right? Um, tabletop, as I say, uh, we used to sit next to each other. Six years of my career, I had never created a full request. Never, ever. I used to write code in a private branch and then I just showed div on my laptop and then the reviewer next to me used to do a tabletop review. Those reviews were passionate in that sense, right? They were passionate. The, the reviewer at times will end up rewriting my code uh, and through the process they'll teach me that, hey, this is a better way of doing this. I, I learned a lot, I learned a lot. Uh, but tabletop reviews, offline, no PRs. Can they scale? They cannot, right? Uh, so what do we have in enterprise scale companies, right? Uh, we obviously have Git PRs. Any PR that you create has to have reviewers. What kind of reviewers? We'll talk about it, right? Any PR at least have, at least in our case, two reviewers. The first reviewer is somebody from your team because he would most likely understand what you are doing in the functional space. So he's the first level reviewer. Uh, the other reviewer mandatory is somebody from a system reviewer panel. Uh, now that panel is looking at this PR from a holistic perspective, from a data, from a system design perspective, from a core reusability perspective, from a cross impact perspective. They look, from, they look at the PR from a different lens. In addition to that, in addition to that, uh, we need to see, understand, detect what has changed in a PR. If somebody is making change in, let's say, a migration or writing a new one, we need subject matter experts, right? So there's a panel for people who are expert in that space. So somebody from that panel is pulled in. If somebody is making a change on the React side, you pull in somebody from that panel. Similarly, right, depending, you detect what has changed. Find somebody from that panel and have them review the PR, right? Now, these reviewers are again very passionate, right? They'll give open, authentic, but constructive feedback on the PRs. Uh, and, and when required, they will also collaborate with the dev. Because sometimes they may say, hey, do it in this way, and the developer will be like, hey, I don't know how to do it, and then they'll collaborate. So it's a collaborative kind of effort. The next one, migrations. Uh, pretty interesting in that sense. 
So, but today I'll talk about schema chain migration. Uh, example, adding a new column or changing the type of existing column. As an example, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, you may be, let's say you have a table, you have a primary column, a primary ID, ID is a type integer. Now with time, the records in your table will increase uh, and ID will run out of space, right? And we actually are seeing this uh, in a lot of places in our application. So what do you do? You have to add a migration, change the type of that primary column to from integer to big int or probably like even further. Uh, you also have to change foreign key references, right? Because that ID column is used maybe in the places in the application, right? So all those tables have to have to be impacted. Now, before I go into what we do at Cooper, I'll, I'll talk about a story from my past. Uh, in my last role, I wrote a feature. Uh, I was adding a new column to a table. I knew that table is probably one of the largest of our earlier stack, right? I, I spoke to my team lead, hey, this is a large table. How much time will it take to add this new column in that table, right? They were like, we are doing this in like off business hours, so it should not take more than a couple of minutes, and that should be fine. So we thought about it, we made that change, we shipped it, but on the day of deployment, we were proven wrong. Uh, so the deployment which takes normally four minutes, five minutes, it took 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It was still loading, still loading, still loading. I was there with my DevOps team, my startup, right? Uh, so I was like, what the hell is wrong? Right? Uh, we, then my CTO was like, hey, who reviewed this, who wrote this? Uh, like I, I told them we thought about it, right? And like we thought about it and we thought this would be fine. And the, the, the bigger problem here is there is no concrete way for you to measure, to benchmark, right? Because like, like, how do you get a quantifiable number of all of that, right? So this is a real life problem that I saw in my earlier days. And I'm not sure how many of you saw that, but I'm, I'm, anybody saw similar problems? I see a raise of hand, a lot of hands in fact. So pretty relatable problem, right? So how do we fix it? Or how do we ensure that this does not happen? Because companies like Cooper, right, they are much bigger we have thousands of customers, so the migration will not run once, it will run thousands of times across thousands of customers, right? So we need to be efficient about it, right? So we at Coupa use something called PT Online Utility, which is by Percona, right? So under the hood, uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, it creates a copy of that live table. Whatever change we have to do, it applies on that copy table. Uh, so the reads and writes on the live table stay as is. They are not impacted. Obviously, it, it may take hours and hours for this DDL to complete. Um, so any change to the live table is synced back to this temp table. Uh, and when this is done, it just swaps uh, the old table with the new one. And only when it swaps for a second or two or three, you see some impact to that table read and write. For every other time, it is absolutely no impact. So we have a system, great, but we need something to test it. Right, uh, because like people may push our imagination. Right, uh, we have a system, but you never know. Right, like so you need to test. So we have a system to test. Uh, we offer devs a chance to test this kind of migrations on production-like, but of course sanitized data. So with that, we get a quantifiable number that hey, this will take three hours, four hours, eight hours. If that number is out of the roof, we try and optimize it. Whatever the number is, if we cannot optimize further, that is a number which we live with. We inform our DevOps team, hey, this will take this long. Else they'll also panic, right? And they'll, they'll, they'll go everywhere. Uh, the next one, automation testing. We spoke about this, a lot of, uh, a great talk yesterday about this. We'll not go into details, but uh, I'd like to just highlight here a couple of points, right? Uh, in my startup, we never wrote test cases. We never ever wrote test cases. Right? I'm, I'm not sure how many people here come from that background, right? but we knew all the reasons because of which we need test cases, but the priorities were different. We were running for our survival, right? In those days, uh, priorities were different. So we never wrote test cases. Uh, when I joined Coupa, it was a mandate to write test cases. Right? I, as a developer who never wrote test cases, were like, fine, let me try it. I tried and I made all the mistakes that we spoke about yesterday, right? I don't know how many people can relate, but all the mistakes that the presenter was talking about yesterday, I made all of them. It took me more time to write test cases 
rather than writing code. So that is the first end problem. Uh, that made me even think that do we still need this? Uh, so the more tickets I got at Coupa, right? With time I got more tickets, more complex ones. Uh, I made changes, I was happy about them. But only when I committed those, I had a PR out, I had hundreds of failures, dozens of failures. Now that made me realize, right? In a vast system, uh, whatever you do, whatever manual testing you do, it can never be enough. You need these kind of checks and balances to give you early feedback. And these test cases are actually very, very, very important. Uh, the question is, how do you run them? Because all developers write test cases, all QBs write test cases. You have tens of thousands of test cases. So how do you run optimally? Somebody spoke about it yesterday. I'll not go into detail, but you need to parallelize across multiple pods, divide and conquer kind of stuff. Next one, performance. Um, something pretty close to my heart. Um, so what do you do, right? As a big company, you write a lot of code. That lot of code is merged into master. Right? Master it is released after a release, like after three months or four months or five months. Right? But you need checks and balances in place which will test sprint over sprint or week over week of any change is causing performance issues. Right? In my startup, the reviewer, the core reviewer used to decide that, hey, this query will cause issue, that query will cause issue. Here also we do that, by the way, yes, we do all of that, but that is not enough. It can never be enough. So we have a very sophisticated lab, which is built by a performance team. They test our code, sprint over sprint, on production-like, but sanitized data. Of course, sanitized, but production-like data. Production-like load, because the load is important. Things, the time vary as per the load, so production-like load is very important. And production-like resources, right? because no point testing something production load, but on resources like local, right, they'll obviously fail. So production-like data, production-like load, production-like resources. They do all of that sprint over sprint. When they have a benchmark that, hey, this transaction should take X amount of time. If that is increasing, decreasing, then fine. But if it's increasing, they'll create tickets, they'll, they'll come and they'll say, hey, this is slow, fix it. Uh, as I said, I'm a manager. I support the app platform team. Being platform, we are the first responders. So they most likely in cases like this, they come to me. Uh, so very recently, about three months ago, four months ago, very early of the release, sprint two of the release, they came to me and then they said that, hey, every transaction in your application is 2x slower. I was like, this is not possible. Right? They said it is. It is happening. Please, please fix it. Uh, so after leaving a denial for a day, I was like, no, this is a problem that we need to solve. Uh, in that sprint, hundreds of commits went in because we are, like, we, are, we are a large application, hundreds of developers, right? And, and sprint is a long time. So I, I tried to find no outliers. The only outlier I saw was a commit in which we were upgrading the Ruby version from 2.x to 3.x. Uh, the supporting data also showed spikes in object allocations, spike in garbage collection cycles, the number of calls to minor GC, major GC, they, they all showed up. So all of this put together gave me a perspective that, hey, this commit can be a problem. Uh, how we fix it, a separate story. Uh, but the point is, without these kind of tests to give you early feedback, you will not be able to catch these and they'll cause much, much, much bigger problems on production, which you'll not be able to fix. The last one, uh, release cycles. Uh, before I talk about release cycles, right, I'll talk about the Coupa infrastructure in that sense, right? So as I said, we have thousands of customers, right? Uh, all of them have different websites on which they operate. It's like a.coupon.com, b.coupon.com, c.coupon.com, and all of that, right? Uh, depending on the scale, if it's a large customer, large volumes, they have a private deployment, they are the only customer in that deployment. Uh, if it is not so big, then depending on the scale, we have n number of customers on the deployment, right? So in general, we have dozens, maybe hundreds of deployments, right? But now, when you are releasing code, when you are deploying code, how do you go about it, right? You can be, like, 
keeping it simple and then you can say, hey, I deploy everything at once. Fine, you can do it, but is it safe, right? Is it safe? Thoughts? I, I don't think it is safe personally, right? Because you're shipping software to thousands of customers at a time, right? No matter what you have. Uh, just in case if things go wrong, right, then that bug will go to production for thousand customers at a time, right? So you don't want to get into all of those territories. Hoopa also doesn't. Hoopa has a sandbox environment for all the customers. All the customers have a sandbox environment. Any change we make, a minor release or a major release, it goes to SBX sandbox instance first. They get time to test. God forbid if something goes wrong, they may report it. We have time to fix it before it is rolled out to production. Uh, the good part is it mitigates risk. Uh, the bad part is you have to deal with multiple release branches, right? Because you suddenly have some customer which is on a newer release, some customer which is on an older release, and then you are doing master, like, so any bug that comes in, right? It may need multiple back propagations. So yes, there is a cost to it, but if you compare it with the benefits it gives you, uh, we believe it's important. So like this strategy helps us. That's it. That covers my content. Uh, it was pretty fast, but, but I like to talk about key takeaways. Uh, when you guys go back to your work tomorrow or day after or like or whenever, right? I would want you guys to look around you. Be curious, as I always say. I am a curious person. I want you also to be curious and, and see what kind of processes exist around you. Right? You may have some, uh, you may understand the reason about it. If you understand, great. If you don't, then talk to people around you. Right? Talk to your CTO, talk to your manager, talk to anybody around you. Try to understand the reason. If you find the reason, great. It is probably necessary and it should stay. If you do not find the reason, for the process to exist, maybe you can consider retiring that process because no process could exist without a reason. On the flip side, uh, I showed some processes across five areas, uh, but then there may be more depending on your functional use cases. If you believe that you do not have any process and if this inspires you in any way, please think on starting that process. So as I always say, what got us here today may not be enough to get us where we want to be in the future. Right? With that, uh, go back, check, think. Uh, the last one, uh, it's a very, very famous quote by the great Albert Einstein. Uh, it's a, I'll, not, I'll not read through it, but I'll try to explain this in a gist. He says that he had no special talent. He just was passionately curious. He never stopped to ask questions. He believes curiosity exists for a reason. I personally live this to my heart uh, and I also want you guys to. So be curious, uh, keep learning, keep growing. That's my time. See you. Any questions? I know we are all hungry, but I'll leave the floor open to any questions. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on uh, trunk-based development or continuous delivery instead of like having a long time release cycle, right? Yeah, no, pretty valid question. So even if we have a long release cycle, we do not have long running branches we do not have long running thing, right? So we continuously keep merging to master, right? And that master is testing via various things. But the release Time happens after a duration. Maybe. Yeah, a minor release happens after two weeks, a major happens after three months. Right? So there are, reasons behind, there are reasons behind it because our customers need time, right? Our, our customers are receptive to change, right? Any big thing that you're trying to ship, they need time to prepare for it. They need time to test for it. So that is one angle that comes into play when we decide is three months enough. So how do you decide months. requirements? Does that come from the client or? Uh, no, 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 no. We are a product-based company, so we define our own requirements. Obviously, a part of the input is our customer surveys, our customer interactions. Right. Thank you. We, we don't build for our customer.
we we take things in perspective we reevaluate i mean yeah. you try to understand the problems clients yes, are facing yes, right yes, and that yes. Yes, be that becomes a requirement yes, the problem yes. you are trying to solve yes but then we look at it from other customers perspective also because one customer may have a problem and 10 others may not have that problem right so with lack of resources we try and be smart or of what do we fix right. and try it yes thank you someone there all right there is a question seem right behind you there that's the last question otherwise the next person who asked the question is probably going to be answerable for lunch so uh, my question is on the sandbox environment you, you mentioned do each clients have sandbox environment or what is the purpose of sandbox environment for the client why do they need to test your code pretty interesting one uh, so we definitely test our code huh. before shipping it so so no questions about it <laughs> right but uh, and we have every process so we never ship bugs like less likely will ship bugs but as i said our customers are receptive to change they need time to adapt to that change right so it's also for them to prepare for that change they are more comfortable and and it's not like we want this it's because they want it they want a preview and especially one of the large like few large customers right they will definitely have a sandbox for them they'll test on them but a large enterprise company will be the last one to upgrade to a release they'll want smaller ones to test it also before they upgrade so is it something that you're talking about adoption of a feature i am like thinking from a perspective where do you have two real time database for a customers or like no 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 so these are very different stacks okay you have is a very different customer stack. will have one database real database one sandbox database yes so these are very different stacks very different deployments sbx a different stack different deployment prd is a different stack different deployment oh. we can talk more offline cool okay. thanks thanks for being a good audience sorry about the deck like technology uh, thank you yeah. puneet that's my time